On the 29th of September, 1985, a 24-year-old man named Jeremy Bamber was arrested at the port of Dover and charged with shooting his entire family. His father, 61-year-old Neville, his mother, 61-year-old June, his sister, 27-year-old Sheila, and her two twin six-year-olds, Nicholas and Daniel. On the 28th of October, 1986, Jeremy was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum tariff of 25 years. To mark his 28th year of wrongful imprisonment, we want to trace one of the biggest issues in this case, that of money and the testimony of key prosecution witnesses, as it was considered that money and the inheritance of the family assets was Jeremy's motive to kill everyone. Judy Mugford, the girlfriend that Jeremy jilted for another woman not long after the tragedies, made up a story about a hitman when she herself had been charged with theft and this particular situation was acted by her to take revenge on an innocent man. She claimed in court that Jeremy had told her that the hitman had told him that he had shot Neville seven times, as the police reported, but Neville Bamber was actually shot eight times. Judy Mugford arranged a deal with the News of the World before the trial for a £25,000 payoff, paid on his conviction only, and that sum is worth about £80,000 in today's terms. She did not sign the contract until minutes after the verdict was announced when she was waiting with photographers, a journalist, and two police officers in a local hotel. And some of her statements and interviews remain under public interest immunity. Furthermore, Judy Mugford was granted immunity from prosecution, provided that she gave evidence for the Crown at Jeremy's trial. So much for fair justice. Jeremy's parents, Neville and June Bamber, were a wealthy and successful farming couple. June Bamber was the daughter of wealthy landowners Leslie and Mabel Speakman. June's sister, Pamela, married a local man named Robert Bowflower, and they had two children, David and Anne, who also went into the farming business themselves. Later, Anne Bowflower married Peter Eaton. They farmed Peter's share of the land which was jointly owned with his brother. Before Neville Bamber's death, Peter's father died and Peter's brother, John Eaton, had inherited half the land which he intended to sell to developers. Concerned that their livelihood would be in jeopardy, Peter and Anne did not obtain financial help to purchase this land from Anne's parents, but instead made an approach to Anne's uncle, Neville Bamber, who bought the land from John so that they were able, still, to farm the acreage until such time as they could afford to repurchase it. This meant that when Neville Bamber died in the tragedies, his son Jeremy now unknowingly owned half of the Eaton's farm. Local gossip was retold about the land deal in police records. Apparently, Neville Bamber had had a fight with John Eaton in a local pub, over some land that Neville had purchased, which Neville felt was vastly overpriced. The jury at Jeremy's trial were suspicious of the testimony of Robert Bowflower and relatives asked the following question. If Jeremy Bamber was found guilty and imprisoned for many years, who would be the beneficiaries of the Bamber estate and monies? Could it be his uncle and family? 
A possible reason for motive for Robert Beauflower's statement about Jeremy's being able to kill his own parents. The Eatons and Beauflowers were, after all, the ones who found the only evidence which convicted Jeremy. The sound moderator. And mysteriously, this was in the very cupboard already searched by the police three days prior to their relatives finding it. The jury were told by a statement from Robert Beauflower that he was wealthy in his own right, but neither the jury nor the defence knew anything about the secret land deal in which Jeremy now owned half of the Eaton's land. It was only in 1986, after the trial, when Peter Eaton told the truth about this deal to the Dickinson investigation which was set up to explore the police handling of the case. Robert Beauflower had also disguised financial affairs from the court in a second way. Jeremy's grandmother, Mabel Speakman, who had survived her husband, Leslie, rearranged her will, leaving a large part of her estate to June and Pamela, her daughters. Robert Beauflower told the jury that he and his wife owned the land that they farmed, but failed to mention that at the time of the tragedies, Mabel Speakman owned the land they farmed, not them, which meant that once Mabel Speakman died, her estate would pass to June and Pamela. But as June was now deceased, and Jeremy was her remaining next of kin, he would also unknowingly have owned half the land they farmed. This only became clear during the statements made by Robert Beauflower to the City of London Police in 1991, when he discussed the fact that after his wife inherited the farm from Mabel Speakman, she gave her husband Robert his own equal share of the land they were farming, known as Carbonell's Farm, which meant that he was a wealthy landowner in his own right. This means that during the trial, Robert Beauflower did not make it clear to the jury that at the time of the tragedies and during the weeks after, he did not owned the land he was farming, therefore he did have a very strong motive to lie to the jury as they had suspected. Owing to the Eaton's secret land deal, and if Mabel Speakman had died before her will was changed, Jeremy unknowingly would have inherited the entire Bamba estate, including half of the Eaton's farm and half of the Bowflower's farm, which would have put their relatives into a financially vulnerable position. According to company's house records, in 1985, N. and J. Bamber Limited had been a successful company worth about £400,000. Neville Bamber, the father, was worth about 310000 and a further 80000 from other personal assets. Jeremy Sher was worth about 75000 After he was convicted, he lost legal control of the company. Between the years 1984 in 1988, N and J Bamber made an average profit of 60,000 a year. Based on these figures, the company would have expected to make about 600,000 pounds in profit, about 60,000 pounds a year, over the next 10 years. Yet the accounts show that the company made less than 4,000 pounds. This excludes the 58,000 pounds from the winding up of the company in 1998. N and J Bamber Limited had a fixed asset value of £79,800 in 1984 and a fixed asset value of zero from 1990 to 1998, meaning that between 1985 and 1989, N and J Bamber Limited lost the whole £79,800 of fixed assets under the control of Peter Eaton and Mr Wilson. Mabel Speakman had been ill for some time, and shortly after the tragedies, but before the trial, she mysteriously changed her will, leaving her entire estate to her daughter Pamela Beauflower. This was just two weeks after she had been declared medically unable to make a statement to the police owing to ill health. During the trial, Robert Beauflower had responded with a definitive statement that included 
Personally, I would have no claim on the estate and would not benefit in any way. Curiously, Robert Bowflower appears in a deed dated the 4th of August 1987, which was made between one Mr. Cock, Mrs. Bowflower, the second Robert Bowflower, and third defendants, Martin Carr. It was agreed and declared that from the respective deaths of Mr. Bamber, Mrs. Bamber, and Mrs. Caffell, Mr. Cock stand possessed of all Mrs. Bowflower's interest in the respective estates of Mr. Bamber, Mrs. Bamber, and Mrs. Caffell upon trust for Mrs. Bowflower's children, the fifth defendant, Mr. Bowflower, and the sixth defendant, Mrs. Eaton, in equal shares absolutely. This means that after the death of Neville, June and Sheila, Basil Cock, the company accountant, was an executor to the estate. He decided that as June's mother, Mabel Speakman, was still alive when the tragedies happened, she would now inherit the whole estate. As Jeremy was convicted of murder, he could not inherit his parents' share, but he still owned 20% of the company, N and J Bamber, in his own right. Anthony Pargater and Jacqueline Wood were now Neville's next of kin, and in 1992 made a claim against Basil Cox's decision to give the entire estate to Mabel Speakman, simply because when Mabel Speakman died before the trial, but after the tragedy, she had left her entire estate to her daughter Pamela Bowflower, wife of Robert. Pamela then kept half the estate for herself, and divided Carbonell's farm between Robert and herself, also giving June and Neville's share of the estate to her children equally, David Bowflower and Anne Eaton. This meant that with Jeremy in prison, the Bowflowers and Eatons now had control of all the family assets, including Jeremy's 20% share. The case went to the High Court of Justice, brought by Anthony Pargater and Jacqueline Wood. But on the first day of proceedings, they all agreed to an out-of-court settlement. This meant that Jeremy would not know exactly what the terms of the settlement were, other than the fact that Anthony and Jacqueline would take Neville Bamber's share of the estate. The statement of claim does not suggest that Anthony Pargater and Jacqueline Wood knew their uncle Neville also owned half of the Eason's farm. The company was eventually wound up many years later, leaving Jeremy with a debt of £16,000, no assets, which was to ensure that he had no finances to fight an appeal. Jeremy, therefore, has been deprived of his own personal wealth because of his conviction and has never been able to obtain the personal money taken from him with which to fight legal action. There is, therefore, no legal aid and he can't progress with this. The N and J Bamber Company solicitor, Mr. Wilson, had made Peter Eaton a director of the company without Jeremy's consent. Jeremy had simply believed that Peter Eaton was acting as a manager after the tragedies. Further to this, in 1987, the company secretary, Barbara Wilson, approached the police and reported a string of fraudulent activity allegedly carried out by Peter Eaton. This included the following. One, Disposal of farm machinery. 2. Sale of combined harvester. 3. Theft of monies. 4. Excessive expenditure. 5. Obtaining of discounts using the Bamba Company. 6. Obtaining of goods being paid for by the Bamba Company. 7. Using manpower from the Bamba estate on his own land. 8. Stealing a tractor engine. 9. Selling off cattle from the Bamba farm. 10. Sale of Jeremy's car and keeping the funds. Essex police failed to investigate the claims until after the first appeal of Jeremy, as this would ensure that the integrity of a key prosecution witness was not brought into question. It is unclear whether or not the allegations relate to the time before Jeremy Bamba was taken into police custody. Anthony Pargeter claimed to have kept his rifle and its accessories at White House Farm, where it is licensed for use. In his 12th of December 1985 statement, he claims he left his rifle at the farm 
And he told the court at trial he bought a sound moderator with the gun, which he kept at White House Farm, and yet no one even questioned where this identical moderator was kept during and after the tragedies. In 1991, Anthony Parvater changed his story and told the City of London Police investigation that his gun was not at the farm. In the same year, he was awarded £40,000 of damages and £60,000 of costs by the Sunday Sport when they had claimed he could have been a suspect in the murders because bullets found at the scene could have been fired by his rifle. It is unclear what his statement of claim to the court actually was. For example, he may have made a claim that his rifle was not after all at the farm, but we simply do not know. The evidence presented in this video, coupled with the material on the website proving Jeremy's innocence, strongly suggests that the court were not told the truth about the relative's financial motive, and neither were the jury clear about Sheila Caffell's history. Her diaries and medical records were refused disclosure to the defence. There is, and never has been, any evidence whatsoever connecting Jeremy Bamber to the killing of his family. The case at trial relied on the testimony of those who benefited from his conviction and from the evidence they obtained three days after the tragedies. For more information on these topics, please visit www.jeremybamba.org or www.jeremy-bamba.co.uk.